Well, as we said earlier, as we were beginning this service today, uh, this is Memorial Day weekend. And so as a nation, we honor the men and even the women who laid down their lives for our freedoms. Having just come out of a military context, I can tell you that uh, most assuredly on every military installation in this nation, our, our service members have been uh, reminded, regaled the past week uh, with, with the stories of, of various heroes who went into the face of danger and, and accomplished something great, risking it all, sometimes paying the ultimate price uh, with their lives. I know as, as chaplains, we're routinely told about Chaplain William Capon, who was a captive in Korea, and how while he was in the POW camp there, he provided aid to the service members, he provided moral support, he provided food and uh, the whole nine yards, and he ultimately uh, died because he would uh, give his rations to the other service members. And so in that kind of context, you need your nutrients, and, and he just didn't have it. And we hold these people as heroes. Every generation has their heroes. Whether it's children from the 80s wearing a white glove on one hand wanting to be like Michael Jackson, or whether it's kids of an earlier generation wanting to be like the Lone Ranger, every generation has its heroes. It could be an athlete like Michael Jordan, Roger Clemens. It could be a rock star. It could be an actor like John Wayne. John Wayne was an inspiration for a generation or two. The politician, Alexander Hamilton, because of that musical, has become a has resurfaced in popularity. It could be a military leader like Patton. Eisenhower, Robert E. Lee. We tend to look up to people, and those same people then affect us in the way we think, the way we act. I remember when I was a boy, it was, it was in retrospect, it was so silly. But there were some older kids, you know, and little kids look up to the older kids. And we were, uh, we were in a context in which the, uh, these older kids, for some silly reason, would, would stuff their pant legs into their socks and wear their socks on the outside. Not, not like you do when you're in the field and you're needing to have uh, you know, protection from ticks. They would just do it. And I thought, this is the coolest thing ever. I want to be like them. So I was walking around with my pants stuck in my socks. And it was ridiculous. And my mom and I remember other adults just shaking their heads. But I was emulating... My heroes, we emulate our heroes. 19th century Scottish social commentator and essayist Thomas Carlyle once said, Show me the man you honor, and I will know what kind of man you are. Why could he make such a statement? Well, we honor people when they model or embody or demonstrate some value that we believe is good and right and important. And so because of that, because they embody something that we believe is good, important, or right, we want to put them forth as something to be commended and something to be emulated. And so, look at the people you honor. What does it say about you? What is important, right, and good in your eyes? Who do you honor? In the early church, there was a group of people who took Epaphroditus as their role model. And uh, if you look at verse 30, it says that Epaphroditus is worthy of honor because he risked his life. Okay, that, that word translated risked is also the word that could be translated as gambled in a wager sense. He gambled his life for the sake of Christ. And so this early order, for lack of a better word, of Christians 
took that word and they made it the name of their of their group. And so they called themselves the Parabolani. It sounds like something from a Dan Brown novel, doesn't it not? But anyway, there was nothing sinister about them. The, the Parabolani, the gamblers, what they did is they put themselves in harm's way. Wherever people were least inclined to be to do the work of the gospel, that's where they went. And so in the late 200s, there was a severe plague that hit the city of Carthage, which is in modern day Tunisia. And the plague was so bad that the pagans were fleeing and they didn't want to even touch the dead bodies because they were afraid of getting infected. And so corpses were literally piling up. And so the Parabolani gambled their lives to go in there and take care of the sick, to make sure that the dead bodies were taken care of. And yes, many of them died. But the effect of that witness had profound fruit. And so a thriving Christian community existed there all the way up until they were uh, extinguished by the invading Islamic armies. As Christians, we rightly hold Jesus as our example par excellence. Jesus is the standard of excellence. But sometimes it can be hard to flesh out, okay, how do, I, how do we flesh out what Jesus did in practical terms? And so here, in this part of Paul's letter, as he's transitioning subjects, he puts this travel itinerary in right here. And he does so because he wants to hold forth these two men as sort of living examples of everything he's been talking about. These two guys, Timothy and Epaphroditus, are the embodiment of all the selfless service that he's been talking about in chapter 2. They are, in essence, modeling the Christ-like attitude that he wants us to have from verse 5. They show us what living as a Christian and imitating Christ look like. So, as I was looking at this sermon, or at this passage, it dawned on me. Next week, we start officer nominations. And I didn't intend this, But here we have a passage in which Paul is calling for godly servant leaders to be both received and honored by the church. And so it is true that as you go into officer nomination time, we need to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 because they list the criteria of what it means that's required for an officer. But I would suggest to you that in this passage, we get a living example of what it looks like to be leader material. What kind of person, what kind of traits, what does it look like in action to see someone who should be a leader that we honor and receive rather than resist and ignore? And so I'm going to suggest to you that in this passage, in the interest of looking to next week, that as you prayerfully consider what man or men in this church has God called and prepared to assume the mantle of responsibility, I'm going to encourage you to look at this passage with me as an example of godly, faithful servant leaders. I think that in this passage, Paul shows us three Christ-like attitudes we need to have. We need to have first a Christ-like perspective towards the church. Second, a Christ-like concern for the church. And third, a Christ-like commitment to the church. Perspective about, concern for, commitment to. What do I mean? Well, the first is a Christ-like perspective about the church. Your leaders need to have a godly understanding of the relationship between the church and Jesus Christ Himself. Just yesterday, I was looking at a recent Pew Research study. Some of you may have seen it. I posted it on my Facebook page. Uh, It said, uh, it assessed the beliefs of of what's important to, to Christians 
and what's important to the world at large. And by and large, there's no difference, which is horrifying. A whopping 20%, they framed it in the positive, 80% of Christians believe that believing in God is important. So that means 20% of professing Christians don't think it's important. That's one in five, by the way. Um, But specifically, specifically, only about 35% of professing Christians believe that worship attendance is important. 35%, one in three. Even less, 28% believe that pitching in and helping out on your congregation is important. That is the state of affairs. Now, it's pretty common. It's, it's natural for you to have a low view of the importance of going to church and of helping out if you have as part of your basic world view and belief that you can have Jesus without having his people. I can love Jesus and his people, not so much. That's optional. I'll go if it benefits me or whatever. But that radically... D, uh, that, 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 that isolated notion of the people from the Christ is radically unbiblical. Jesus in Scripture is closely associated with His people. For example, one metaphor that's used in Scripture is we are the bride of Christ. Most people take offense when you insult their spouse. If you insult K, you may as well have insulted me. In fact, I'll probably be more upset if you go after my wife than if you go after me. And that, and I'm not unusual. That's most people. So it's no wonder in Scripture that Jesus defends his people. But another metaphor in Scripture is that of the body. We are Jesus' body. And there is a close relationship with a person to their body. If I come up and punch you, I haven't just punched your body, I've punched you. We don't say, oh, you didn't really hurt me. My, I, I, my true self is the spiritual thing. Your body's part of you. Which is why it's important. Now this association between Christ and His body, us and our body, is seen very clearly in Matthew 25. You may remember it. Jesus is talking about the end of time when, when He separates the sheep from the goats and the people on His left and His right. And He says to the righteous, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Okay, Remember, he's, Jesus is saying it and they say, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or in prison? And what does Jesus say? Whatever you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. Okay? So, there is a close relationship between Jesus and His people. When you take care of His people, you take care of Jesus. When you dismiss, harm, or injure, or insult, or ignore the people of God, Jesus takes it personally. What does this have to do with this passage? Because a godly perspective of the relationship of the church with Christ calls for us to see that when we bless the church, we bless Christ. When we are concerned for the well-being of the church, that is the interest of Christ. It's right here. Look with me, please, at verse 20 and 21. Paul's commending Timothy to them, his young apprentice. And he says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Then verse 21, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So in this passage, your welfare is equated with the interests of Christ. Okay? Christ's interest is your welfare. Life in the church can be pretty messy. People can be wonderful. 
Christians are capable of some of the most gracious and self-sacrificing acts of caring in the world. But Christians can be real ornery too, can they not? And ornery, I think, is the right word. (laughs) But even when they're not being bad, life in the church can be messy and tough because there's competing interests, there's competing perspectives, there's competing tastes. And it can be hard to to really want to lean towards the people who are different than you or who don't really like your, your focus or emphasis or whatever. It can be messy. And we can be tempted to think that, uh, that man, I don't need to mess with that. But a leader in the church is called to see that taking care of each and every person here, taking care of this flock is Christ's interest. It is what is a matter of concern to Jesus. You can't think about your ministry or serving God apart from the well-being of the people of God. If you separate the two, you're on a dangerous territory. Once I meet a pastor friend who talks about serving Jesus and it's an isolation from the people he's serving, he's not really serving the people there anymore. Your interest is bound up in Christ. And Christ is bound up in you. So when you're looking for a godly servant leader, they've got to understand that when they're serving you, they're serving Christ. And if they want to serve Christ, they need to serve you. There are no little people in the church. It's easy to think, oh, doing the Lord's work is up here preaching or or out doing evangelism or something like that. When you serve the body, you serve Christ. You serve Christ. So when we have people up in the nursery taking care of little squirmy babies, they're doing the Lord's work. They're serving Jesus. When we have people setting up tables, taking out trash, cleaning the floors, bringing meals, that's serving Jesus. And it's important. But you have to have the perspective that when you do something for the church, you're doing it for Jesus. That drives you. And it takes it off the mundane and elevates it to something important. So, a servant leader needs to see his commitment to you as part and parcel of his commitment to Jesus. If he doesn't, then he's not really going to be genuinely concerned for your welfare. So who in this congregation understands that when they serve the church, they're serving Christ? And that they need to serve Christ in the context of serving His people. That is a characteristic of a godly leader. But the second thing is a concern for the well-being of the church. It's precisely because your welfare is of interest to Christ that anyone who's going to be a true servant leader needs to have concern for the people of Christ. What's interesting is if you look in verse 20 where he talks about Timothy and it says that there's no one like him who's going to have a genuine concern for your well-being. That word translated concern there is the same Greek word that in other contexts is translated as worry. The Greeks only had one word for that. Now we parse it out and and we differentiate between, oh, the good kind of concern and the bad kind of concern. But the Greeks just had one word. But the word means an anxious concern based upon an apprehension of impending or possible danger or misfortune. In other words, think about the things that keep you up at night. You fret about. You fret about your kids, how they're going to turn out. You fret about where the next the money for that repair is going to come from. You, you, you fret about all sorts of things. That, that, that spot on your back, I don't know. You fret about things. That's the same word that's applied to Timothy here as he thinks about the well-being of the church. 
A godly servant leader is worried, in a good sense, for the well-being of the people of God. So, if you're going to be a servant leader in the church, you have to care enough to, let me put it out here a little bit strongly, to lose a little bit of sleep for the sake of the people of the God. If they're not that important to you, then you're probably not going to be prepared to make the sacrifices for them. Do you care? But look at verse 20. There's no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Your there is plural, so it's all y'all's welfare. And then down in 26, the same basic sentiment is, is expressed by Epaphroditus. Uh, Paul says of Epaphroditus, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Okay, so both men are concerned by a well-being for the church. And this is so important. In our Western culture, we are so highly individualized that we think of individuals. What does the effect of this have on individuals? And so we think in terms of our friends and their agendas, or our clique, and our values, whatever. But when you're a leader, you are called to think about the good of the group. And that takes courage. And it takes humility. Because when you have to bring a group together, and this group is composed of individuals who have their own values and priorities, you sometimes have to make a decision that doesn't make everybody feel like their values are important to you. But you have to care about the group. And that's hard in our day and age because we're taught that the individual is so important that if we make them feel like their personal thoughts aren't important, that we're the bad guy. People who put the needs of the group above the individual are expressed in contemporary media as the bad guys. For example, think of Captain America the Winter Soldier. The main, the main sh uh, Hydra or S.H.I.E.L.D. boss I'm sorry you haven't seen it. But he, one of his lines is, I don't care about the ship. I care about the fleet. In other words, individuals are expendable. And that's the attitude. But a fact of life for a leader of any organization is you have to put the group first. That means laying aside my own personal preferences and agenda what is in the interest of the group? And this is what Timothy was capable of because he was committed to the whole group. He didn't want to write off that person in the back corner who was a little too annoying. He didn't want to dismiss that, that person who was just a little too pestering. He was concerned for everybody. And so was Epaphroditus. So we are to honor people like that because it's hard. But also, concern is not just for the big group. It is for the individual. Look here at how Paul talks about Timothy. He's like a son to him. And the Philippians know this. Paul had Timothy with him when he founded the church in Philippi. And here he's writing this letter over a decade later, and Timothy has been with him. Learning from him, working with him, learning the trade, so to speak. And he's gone out as, a, as an apostolic emissary. He's deeply, personally committed to him. And then look how he addresses Epaphroditus. This man here who's part of the Philippian uh, congregation, he, he uses five, five phrases to describe Epaphroditus, each communicating his love. Look at this in, uh, in Epaphroditus in, um, in verse 25. For I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, your messenger, or your apostle in the Greek, and minister, to my need. He loves this guy. And so as a result, when, he, when he's speaking about how he would have felt had he died, 
He said, when God showed mercy and, and, and kept Epaphroditus from dying, it kept him from sorrow upon sorrow. Wait a minute, I, I thought Paul's always happy. I thought, Paul, no, Paul's always joyful. Remember, I said that joy is not an emotion. It's an attitude. Which is why Paul can be joyful all the time and still say, I would have had sorrow upon sorrow had Epaphroditus passed away. So a servant leader needs to keep his eye out on the big picture. But we also need to remember that the big group is composed of individuals, and individuals are important. And it's true, as Jesus tells us, sometimes the shepherd needs to leave the 99 and go pursue that one. But sometimes the shepherd needs to protect the 99 from that one. And it takes wisdom and godliness and patience to make that distinction. And that all stems from their concern. So, a godly perspective about Christ and the... Is it, is it messing up because of, I mean... All right, I just pushed it away from my face. Let's see if that fixes it. Sorry. I guess it's time for a trim. <laughs> so a godly perspective of the relationship. Okay, it's not touching now. A godly perspective of the relationship between the church and Christ. And then a godly concern for the church. But then we also need to see a Christ-like commitment to the church. It's fun and exciting to start something new. It is. People will raise their hands and say, yeah, I'll do this. But as soon as the newness wears off, they just sort of cast it aside, don't they? As soon as, as, soon as the, the demands of duty and responsibility pile up and, and the thrill and excitement of, of all the newness goes away, people just kind of have second thoughts. I mean, in the Army, I encountered a whole bunch of kids who enlisted you know, they, they were hoping they were going to be the hometown hero. They had in mind, you know, being the next Audie Murphy, if you know who that is. I mean, they just, they just wanted to be superstars. And they envisioned, you know, kicking in doors and, and all this stuff. And for those people, the, the bubble doesn't burst when the drill sergeant's yelling at them. That's, that's kind of, they knew that. They knew the drill sergeant yelling at them was part of it. No, what burst these kids bubble and they just want to give up is when they have to go out in the rain and do police call, picking up cigarette butts off the ground after a parade. Or when they're standing there digging a ditch. Or they have to just go and clean weapons. Or when they have to come back early on Sundays because they have to go clean latrines, restrooms. That kind of stuff. That, just, that makes them feel like they're wasting their life. And so they want to quit. Happens all the time. Now in the church, there are people who thrive on being recognized. There are people who thrived upon compliments. They love attention. And so they'll volunteer in to, for anything that'll scratch that itch. But then as soon as the adoration fades, or as soon as the criticism start coming, and you're going to be criticized. As soon as the criticisms come, oh man, this isn't worth it. I only got one life and I don't want to live it doing this. And they quit. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said this, All great masters are chiefly distinguished by the power of adding a second, a third, and perhaps a fourth step in a continuous line. Many a man had taken the first step. With every additional step, you enhance immensely the value of your first. Beginning something is important, but it's the follow-through, the commitment and the dedication to follow through. And the church needs commitment. It's easy to start something. But will you follow through to completion? Faithfulness is proven and demonstrated through experience. 
Timothy here, he says, you know Timothy and his proven worth for at least 10 years. Paul had been mentoring Timothy, increasingly giving him responsibilities because responsibility has to be meted out. You can't just give responsibility to someone without first testing them. It's a recipe for them to collapse. You have to nurture leaders. And he had done that. Epaphroditus, he's a fellow worker. He's a fellow soldier. He's their messenger and minister in their need. He was tested and tried and found faithful. So, the importance of faithfulness and dedication cannot be understated. If we entrust something to someone who then, after counting the cost after the fact, says forget it, and they drop it and walk away, it's far worse and has far more repercussions than if we had just wisely selected perhaps someone else on the front end. So, as we consider, who would God have be elders and deacons in this church? Reflect upon the fact that we need people who have a Christ-like attitude and understand that they serve Christ by serving the church. We need people who understand that they have to have a godly concern for the church, for your well-being. And we need people who are prepared to follow through with dedication and recognize that dedication requires sacrifice. Paul says of the others, they pursue their own interests, but not Timothy. He had set aside his personal ambitions to pursue the good of God's people. And we see Epaphroditus, a true champion, He'd gotten sick at a point where it would have made more sense for some people just to call it a day and go home and recover. But he pressed on. He was on death's door, and he still wanted to make sure that he brought the ministry that he was called to bring to the person who needed it. Self-sacrifice. That's dedication. In John 10... Jesus talks about himself being the great shepherd. And he talks about how everyone else is a hireling. And how these false shepherds, they flee at the first sign of danger. But the true shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You know that? Godly servant leaders are people who won't run as soon as the going gets tough. You need people who will stand and fight for you fight with you to guide you to where God wants you to be. So, Christ-likeness is a wonderful thing. But don't for a minute think that it's a weak thing. These men here are strong. They're godly. They love the people of God collectively and individually. They see that when they help someone grow in Christ, they are doing the Lord's work. And they're prepared to lay down their lives to make sure that you grow. So, who will you select to be an elder or a deacon? I pray that it's someone who models the very traits and characteristics modeled by Timothy and Epaphroditus. A Christ-like perspective of the church a Christ-like concern for the church, and a Christ-like commitment to the church. These three qualities flesh out what it means to be a servant leader. Who will you choose to be your leaders? Let's pray. Word of God speak.